Hello and welcome to this week's Bible study. This is the first one of the new year, so happy new year to you. Let me explain that over the next three weeks we're going to do a very short series on Jesus in the Old Testament. And the reason for that is because many of us will be restarting reading the Bible again and maybe we're diving back in the Old Testament. Maybe you've tried reading the Bible all the way through and you've got stuck when you've got to the end of Genesis or you've got to the building of the tabernacle or you got to numbers and all these lists of names or I don't know you got to Leviticus and it feels irrelevant to you. Well I want to get you excited about the Old Testament. Maybe you think it's a mystery. You can't figure it out and you'd need to go to a Bible college or set aside hours and hours of study every day just to try and understand it. Well, the Bible is given to us to make the simple wise. And the Bible is accessible for even children to understand. And what's going to get us motivated and get us hungry for the Old Testament is to see Jesus there. Because Jesus is precious to us. And Jesus said that the Old Testament is all ultimately about him. And if we can see him there, then we'll want to go there. We won't read the Old Testament out of duty, but we'll do it out of delight. Because we delight in our Saviour. And we're going to look over the next three weeks how Jesus is all the way throughout the Old Testament. And three, uh, three points in particular. Jesus is pictured. Jesus is promised and Jesus is present in the Old Testament. And our focus today is how Jesus is pictured in the Old Testament. I have a question, let me ask you. Have you got a favourite picture? Not in the Bible, but in general. It could be a photograph, it could be a painting. Have you got a favourite one, one that stands out from all the rest? It's probably very difficult for you to choose just one because we have so many, don't we, on phones, on computers. Maybe even in photo albums, if you're old-fashioned. Well, actually, I don't know. But is there one? And if you do have a very special picture that is dear to you, why is it special to you? Maybe it's a very, very special place. Maybe it's of a very special person or people or uh, at an event. And as you look at those pictures that are special to you, it evokes all sorts of emotions, doesn't it? They're not the subject matter in and of themselves. It's just a piece of paper or a canvas with lines and colour arranged in a certain way, isn't it? And yet they represent something far greater, something that we uh, hold as very dear. And in the same way, these pictures in the Old Testament that we see, they have great value to us because Jesus is precious to us and they, they show us the wonder, the glory of who he is. And before we dive in and I give you some examples of how Jesus is pictured in the Old Testament, let me explain something that is often misunderstood. It's often said that you need the Old Testament to understand, sorry, you need the New Testament to understand the Old Testament. But actually, it's the other way around. The Old Testament is used to explain the events of the New Testament. How do the New Testament authors write and explain all that's going on in the unfolding gospel? The life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, the giving of the Spirit and the gospel being preached to all the nations. Well, the New Testament writers refer back to the Old Testament to explain what goes on. You see, we need the pictures of Jesus to understand who he is and why he's come and his great work of salvation. So hopefully you can see how important this is. And I really do hope that you'll be inspired to look up some of these pictures for yourself. And as you read through the Old Testament for yourself, you'll have your eyes open and that the Spirit would show you Jesus in these wonderful ways. So here are just some examples. It's not an exhaustive list, but I want to give some broad categories of how Jesus is pictured in the Old Testament. Firstly, you don't have to go far on the first day of the on the first on the first day of creation, on the first page of the Bible. God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And what did Jesus say of himself? 
said, I am the light of the world. You see, written into creation, there are these glorious pictures of Jesus. God didn't just make things the way that he did because it seemed like a, an all right way to do it. That will do, you know. He did it with intention. And if we have our eyes opened by the Spirit, then the world around us is filled with pictures of Jesus. The heavens declare the glory of God. And as you read through the account of the creation, the heavens and the earth, you can see different uh, different ways in which Jesus is pictured. We learn of him. You could see on the third day, seeds and what Jesus said about himself being like a seed planted in the ground. You could pick up the theme of rest or Sabbath on the seventh day and how Jesus is the fulfilment to that. So that's a, a broad category there to start us off. But another one is animals. Animals picture Jesus in particular, the ones who were sacrificed on behalf of the guilty. These substitutes that died in the place of sinners. The very first example of this is just after Adam and Eve were banished out of the Garden of Eden, the Lord himself sacrificed an animal in order to clothe, to cover the shame of Adam and Eve who had rebelled against God. And that is a glorious picture of the Lord Jesus in his own death, how he died in order to cover our shame, atone for our sins, to make us acceptable to God. And of course, this theme goes through the Old Testament, building up to, to Jesus' uh, once and for all death on the cross. But in the Old Testament, you have the Passover lamb, for instance, and you have the Levitical law. They are all pointing to Jesus. It was not in the death of the animals that, uh, that the Old Testament believers were saved because the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. They can, it can never provide forgiveness of sins. There is only one God, there is only one way to be saved, and there is only one church, people of God. And that is true across the world today, and it's true down through the ages. The Old Testament saints, the believers in the Old Testament, the people of God, were rescued from their sin and forgiven by putting their trust in the one that we put our trust in, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, he hadn't been born. Yes, he hadn't died for their sin. But because of their faith in that certainty that he would and how it was pictured in all these different ways, that they had their sins truly forgiven. So anyway... Uh, getting a bit off topic. We've seen how in creation, we've seen the animals, their broad categories, and also objects. Jesus isn't above being pictured in any sort of way. Even in objects, Jesus is pictured for us. In particular, you could think of the manna as the nation of Israel had been redeemed from Egypt and were wandering in the wilderness, and the Lord rained down this bread from heaven. It's manna, which means, what is it? Or what's it, you know? And what did Jesus say of himself? He said, well, Moses gave, gave you the bread of angel, the bread of heaven. But the Father has given you the true bread from heaven. And he said, I am the bread of life. Or another object in the Old Testament that pictures Jesus is this quite obscure passage, really. Um, you might not be aware of it, maybe, but it's in Numbers chapter 21. And it's this bronze snake or serpent that is put on a pole. You read it for yourself, you figure out, but you need to understand that picture in order to understand the most famous verse in the whole Bible, John 3, 16. Check it out for yourself, that Jesus is pictured through objects in the Old Testament and buildings as well. I suppose buildings are kind of like objects, but they're, they're more than that, aren't they? You could think about how the ark represents Jesus and the salvation that we have in him at the time of Noah and the flood. Or uh, I suppose the most famous, the most obvious ones are the tabernacle, the special tent of meeting constructed according to the pattern that was revealed to Moses as he was up on the mountain. Um, we're told the, the details of the construction three times of the tabernacle uh, in how it would be built, when it was, and during it was built, and when it had all been completed. So it's a very, very important image for us. And it pictures so much. It, 
it represents the order of the whole universe, the heavens and the earth, and how they relate to one another. They uh, picture for us the church, the people of God, but they also importantly picture the Lord Jesus Christ. It said in John chapter 1 that the word became flesh and dwelt. The word there is tabernacled among us. It's important, isn't it? And then the tabernacle, uh, as the people of God come into the promised land, uh, eventually the temple is built. And what did Jesus say? Destroy this temple and in three days God will raise it again. Moving on, swiftly on, buildings and also places, another category, uh, and how Jesus is pictured. I invite you to look up the cities of refuge. There's a number of times where that they're mentioned, but one of which is Numbers chapter 35. And you could even look up the, the, what the names of the cities of refuge mean. That would be worthwhile for you to do. But I suppose the most uh, famous way of seeing how Jesus is pictured in the Old Testament is through people. Uh, this kind of study is called typology, by the way, and these types uh, it means pictures of Jesus. And people reflect who Jesus is and what he'd come to do. You have Adam and Eve, and they're created in the image of God, and you could also see their, their God-ordained rule over creation under God. Obviously that got um, that fell, that got lost, but Jesus is called the image of the invisible God in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. You could think about how the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, how they reflected who Jesus is. These patriarchs who uh, were shepherds and yet they fulfilled, they were like prophets and priests and kings all wrapped up. But then as I talk about prophets, priests and kings, these are the ones, as you go through the story of the Old Testament, these are the ones who were anointed with oil, uh, which means having oil poured over your head and what that symbolized was the Holy Spirit setting them apart and equipping them for the work of the Lord and uh, the word Messiah is the same word as Christ in a different language and what it literally means is anointed one so the prophets were Messiahs with little m's or Christ with little c's because they were anointed they were set apart and equipped by the Spirit to do the work that God chose them for. Likewise, kings were, but most of all, priests were anointed more than anyone else. And Jesus ties up all these things together because he is the Christ, he is the prophet, he is the king of kings, he is the priest of God most high. He is our high priest. Anyway, I'll, I'll get too excited if I keep on talking about that. Uh, lastly, I'll end with this broad category of a nation the whole nation of Israel picture Jesus and how is that well in the book of Exodus the Lord says of Israel the nation that they are his firstborn son his firstborn son and they were meant to be a light to the nations they were meant to live in such a distinctly, in such a good way. It was meant to be obvious that here was a community of peace where heaven and earth had been reunited. All the nations of the world would flock to them and want to, want to share in their wisdom and share in that life there. Israel was meant to be a light to the world. And yet we really get these few and far between glimmers of that actually happening. You see it at the Exodus event, you see it in the reign of Solomon, but really the, the, they fail in this regard. But Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. He is the heir of all things. He is God the Son and he is the light of the world. Anyway, hopefully I've piqued your interest enough for you to do your own study and may the Spirit open your eyes to Jesus. This is really a, a spiritual matter, by the way, so do pray before reading the Bible 
how you could look at Second Corinthians in the early chapters and see how the Spirit needs to unveil our eyes in order to see Christ uh, throughout the Old Testament. So do do that. But I hope that your curios curiosity has been sparked and that you will be you'll be wonderfully blessed as you see Jesus in the Old Testament as he's pictured in such a vast and rich uh, and in a variety of ways. And of course, as we meditate on these miniature pictures of Jesus, the goal has to be that we would love Jesus more. And therefore, we would reflect Jesus more and more. Isn't that an amazing thought? That the pictures of, pictures of Jesus are not just in the Old Testament, in this book. It's not just a stationary thing, but God is still creating images of Jesus for the world to see. That's you, and that's me. May God do this. May he get all the glory. God bless.